<laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, uh, yes, it is a little bit of a speech tonight. Um, it's a little bit longer than usual, so thank you for indulging me, but there'll still be time for general discussion as well when I'm done. Um, so free speech obviously is a massive topic, um, and despite the fact that I'm talking for a longer time than usual, I'm actually going to be quite narrow in my focus. So I'm focusing in on um, campuses because that's where we're based and also because that has been a key battleground um, at this moment in time. And I'm also honing in um, pretty closely on what the right is up to. Um, but feel, please feel free to expand that discussion back out again during the discussion part of the meeting. And partly I'm honing in on the right and all of their kind of talking points just to just to get that out of the way, you know what I mean? Just to really establish that we know what the right is up to and to kind of clear space to move forward of the discussion from there. Um, and I want to end um, talking a little bit about Palestine because, as Brad mentioned, um, this is an issue where censorship and free speech is actually a live issue for the left. Um, and also because I think that it is actually opening up some um, different areas of this politics as well, which I'll talk about um, later. So I want to start by acknowledging something that I don't think gets acknowledged enough, having these free speech discussions, which is that this is not happening on the terrain that we, the left, would like. Um, so to a greater or lesser extent, the right has successfully set the terms of the debate, um, at least up until recently, and they have put us on the back foot. Um, so in the first place, the right have been using the issue of free speech to deflect attention away from the content of speech. Um, which obviously disadvantages us because the content of speech is something that we can actually organize and mobilize around. So if someone says something racist in a public forum, that's something that we can then mobilize anti-racist forces around. Um, whereas when the terms are suddenly shifted to he has the right to say that, that becomes much harder to um, organize and mobilize around. Um, the various right-wing deflection tactics um, tend to land us in a situation. Are we good? tend to land us in a situation um, where we're operating either within a legal framework, so sort of debating the minutiae of um, free speech laws and protections, or within a sort of philosophical or semantic framework, you know, of what is free speech? What does it mean? What are the limits of free speech? Um, and I don't want to say there's no room for us to operate in those kind of realms or like no use there, but it's not where our strength lies. And when it comes to these sort of philosophical debates about, you know, what is the limits of free speech? Is it a good? Um, we need to be clear that that is not actually the framework that our opponents are operating in, at least not in good faith. Um, and also that, you know, abstraction doesn't serve us in this situation, in my opinion. So what the right wing is doing is they're perpetuating this long running narrative that the left, that youth, that university students in particular are censorious, hypersensitive, anti-democratic. Um, and this is proven part of an effective strategy of whipping up the fears and resentments of their political bases, of the middle class, of the wealthy, of the old, and also stirring up and sort of inflaming a sense of grievance among right-wing students and particularly academics as well when they find themselves in the minority on political or um, social justice questions. Um, and this has proven quite effective um, in some realms in kind of cohering people to a broader reactionary political project. Um, so this talk is partly prompted by the free speech policy <laughs> that is put forward in the National Act Coalition Agreement. Um, so this policy is in its early stages, it hasn't been put forward as a bill yet, but it's already kind of causing um, a discussion and chatter on the universities. And even if not much comes from the bill itself, I think the wider politics and kind of rhetoric around it is something we're going to have to contend with. Um, so handily, the ACT Party put forward a similar bill in 2022, so we can actually see how the discussion went around that bill. Um, and it has what looks like a similar aim as this proposed policy. So it required universities to adopt a free speech policy and threatened their funding if they didn't comply with this. Um, at the time, this bill didn't make it past the first reading. 
Um, the arguments against it were, one, that there were already sufficient protections of freedom of expression in law and in the concept of academic freedom. Um, two, that this law could allow the spread of disinformation and bigoted agitation against oppressed groups. Um, and I think what we really mean here is that it was aimed to facilitate that. Um, and three, um, a few people also pointed out that this bill didn't actually represent an expansion of the freedoms of universities, but an encroachment of the government into um, universities and how they regulate their speech. So I want to pull out a few quotes from the parliamentary debate of this bill because I think it's illustrative of the kind of um, rhetoric that we're seeing here this time around as well. So first from the right, you have the high-minded defenses of the principle of free speech that are also like kind of completely nonsensical um, and hypocritical. So for example, the ACT MP who put forward the bill, James McDowell, uses the example of um, the Springbok tour somehow and says um, that it wouldn't have been as, su as successful as it had been, the protests against the Springbok tour, if it was an environment where people weren't allowed to make unpopular statements. I think he's sort of like maybe misremembering the Springbok tour era, the protests that happened there. Um, from the high-minded, things descend into the low and petty very quickly. So this is from National's Simon O'Connor. Um, he says, I want everything the Labour Party and the radical Greens say banned. I don't want to see them on universities because if I walk there tomorrow, I could have a hurt feeling. I could have a hurt feeling. I assume that's the voice that he did. Um, and this sort of thing carries on throughout the debate. So there's lots of interjections of people just shouting cancel culture. Um, at one point, O'Connor makes a pronoun joke, like it's very classy stuff. Um, and I don't think that it's like just immaturity or incompetence. I think that it's deliberate. This is the tenor of discussion that they want to set. Um, in terms of the examples that are cited um, by the right wing MPs to argue their case, the main ones they talk about is the fact that um, an anti-trans speaker aligned with Speak Up for Women was cancelled at or not allowed to speak at Auckland University of Technology. There was a cancellation of a speaking event by Canadian far-right provocateurs Stefan Molyneux and Laura so uh, Lauren Southern at an Auckland City Council venue. Um, and the cancellation by Massey University of Don Brash's planned speaking event follow critici following criticism of his anti-Maori views. Um, and his support for the aforementioned provocateurs. Um, so there's a few things to note here. So one, these are all right-wing examples and that is not um, an accident. So it, sometimes the line will be pushed that this is a sort of bipartisan agenda for free speech, um, but it, you will, we will be mostly dealing with right-wing examples and the left-wing examples are sort of very tokenistic. Um, and the line between supporting the right to speech of these people and the actual content of their speech is frequently blurred. So O'Connor characterizes the openly transphobic speak up for women as quote, a bunch of women who quote, wanted to go on to university and talk about women. Um, and elsewhere they just referred to as simply feminists. Um, two, none of these examples are academics, university staff <laughs> or students. And three, Molin Molyneux and Southern, this example didn't actually happen on a university campus and has nothing to do with universities. Um, this is what the National MP Michael Woodhouse had to say about this example. He says, members may recall a couple of years ago that two Canadian provocateurs who had very strong views about the correlation between race and IQ were denied access to public facilities in Auckland in order to hold a public meeting. And that caused quite a furore. Now, I raise this point because at the same time as that was going on in New Zealand, in Dunedin, at the University of Otago, oh, I actually have this quote written down, was one of the world's leading researchers, the late Emeritus Professor Jim Flynn, who wrote extensively on race and IQ and gender and IQ, and would have had a hundred arguments to refute Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux, the two Canadians who couldn't come. <sighs> Um, so Woodhouse is kind of like showing his ass here because why on earth would Emeritus Professor Jim Flynn want to waste his time with debating these people? Why should he? Um, so part of the project here is to feed the disinformation machine um, and to give right wing hacks legitimacy by having actual subject matter experts come and meet them in debate. 
Um, and I will revisit the brash example later because that one actually does happen on a university campus. Um, but there are some general points that I want to make about the right wing arguments here. Um, so one, they are conflating the actions and politics of university administrations with those of students. At one point, O'Connor says, our universities have been captured by a bunch of left wing progressives. Um, at other times, they are referred to as activists and radicals, the actual university admins, um, we wish. Um, and they also conflate student protest with university censorship. Um, so there's clearly nothing in these arguments that is empowering to students. And in fact, you know, as we can see from O'Connor's rhetoric, they actually view students with um, pretty open contempt. In terms of the response from the left wing parties, um, I've outlined the main arguments against the bill, which were successful um, this time around. I think when you kind of zoom in and some of the rhetoric um, being used by the left in this debate, it doesn't quite seem adequate. There are some sort of weaknesses and pitfalls um, that I've sort of alluded to already. So this is from Chloe Strawbrick, um, who talks about, you know, what happens when rights, uh, you know, different kinds of rights rub up against each other. And she says, we in this chamber balance those rights and those in state institutions and those responsible for provision of those campuses in these institutions, to which this <laughs> bill seeks to prescribe how they could balance and actually not balance because it is absolutely about absolutism. Um, and it's not necessarily that nothing she's saying here is correct sort of in, in the abstract, um, but she's taking the right wing's arguments far too much in good faith. So the right wing are not free speech absolutists. That is not their motivation for pushing these sorts of bills. And that's not how they act when they're in power as we are seeing now. Um, so in my opinion, not enough is being done to sort of expose the deliberate political project that the right is engaged in here. And I'd like to take some time to correct that. Um, and I'm going to take some time to talk about the US because this is a project that is much more developed um, there than it is here. Um, and in fact, in the US, university free speech laws like the ones that have been put forward by ACT have been implemented in some states and have resulted in the defunding of universities. While at the same time, a bunch of other laws um, cracking down on free speech have also been introduced. And this has been part of a sort of broader right wing offensive on college campuses, um, which has seen things like the rollback of affirmative action and uh, wide ranging um, attacks on uh, diversity initiatives and things like that. And more broadly, of course, in, in a ways that I've sort of already alluded to, um, the cultural politics has been part of the Republican and the right wing strategy in the US. I do want to be clear, though, that the US-ness of, of this issue we're facing can be overstated and that, you know, the problem with these politics isn't that they're foreign, but that they are bigoted. Um, and if, you know, if they take root here, it will be because there is fertile ground for them to take root. And if they don't, it'll be because the right wingers here have decided that homegrown New Zealand style racism and bigotry is sufficient for their purposes. Um, so, I am, so I'm going to give a sort of very short history of um, these culture war campus politics in the US, um, starting with the Red Scare reinventing itself with the PC panic of the late 80s and reviving in the 2010s with another wave of panic around um, things like cancel culture. And I want to highlight something which is often overlooked, which is the way that sort of deliberate political strategizing and organizing has gone into this. Um, and yeah, I'm drawing a lot on the work of US journalist Michael Hobbs, who has made several very entertaining podcasts on this topic. Um, so starting with William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale. So written in 1951, um, this text strikes a very different note to later panics and to the rhetoric we're seeing now, because he's not pretending to be advocating for free speech. His book is solidly part of these Red Scare politics. He's openly calling for people to be fired. Um, he does actually name specific professors um, in this book, by the way, that he thinks should be discharged. Um, and he's looking to get rid of people who are not sufficiently Christian, not, con not sufficiently capitalist, not sufficiently conservative from campuses. So it's interesting that there's this difference, but then also the note of sort of threat and persecution from radicals continues throughout these, um, these books, regardless of what the actual context is. And I think in this, in this context, it makes it much more clear what this rhetoric of 
threat is all about, which is a rallying cry to people who already have power to mobilize to defend it. So God and Man at Yale drew on um, right-wing organizing that was already happening on campuses, often drawing on um, material that was much more sort of hard right than what he ends up putting in his book. Um, and in turn sort of gives a bit boost to and helps to build right-wing organizing on campuses. So throughout the 60s and 70s, partly in response to the threat posed by the civil rights movements, um, conservatives make this deliberate push to get right-wing people and right-wing ideas onto college campuses. Um, and groups backed by sort of very wealthy people um, campaign to get conservatives into university positions. Um, they fund right-wing newspapers on campus. Um, they target left-wing initiatives with, um, or left-wing figures with initiatives such as hotlines that you can call to snitch on your prof uh, professor for being too radical. Um, and they also funded lawsuits against left-wing professors. Um, so as the red, as the red scare kind of um, uh, changes tack, you get a rebranding and this sort of well-funded right-wing movement um, it helps to fund and publish the books that spur the um, late 80s, early 90s political correctness panic, which I'm sure many people here remember um, with fondness. Um, more or less the same panic re-emerges in the 2010s with different lingo, this time around concepts like um, cancel culture and things like that. So here's a taste of the rhetoric of the PC panic from Roger Kimball's book, um, his book from 1990, Tenured Radicals. So, quote, certain subjects such as affirmative action and homosexuality have been removed from civil debate. So strong is the force to accept the politically correct view. It is a manifestation of what some people are calling liberal fascism. Political scientist Robert Weisberg famously said of conservatives, we are the queers of the 1990s. Um, something that the central texts in both the PC panic and the 2010s panic do is they divorce the actions of left-wing students um, from the wider context and particularly from what the right is up to. So Alan Bloom in his 1987 book, The Closing of the American Mind, complains about the militancy of African-American students at Cornell University in the 1960s when he's teaching there. Um, without mentioning that the biggest protest at Cornell took place in 1969 after a cross burning on campus, nor the fact that the Africana Study Center, founded partly in response to these protests, was burned down by an art arsonist in 1970. The 2010s panic is disturbing to look back on because it happened during the rise of Trump and Trumpism. So the thesis of the 2018 book, The Coddling of the American Mind, is that hypersensitivity and censoriousness from left-wing students is leading them to become um, a threat to democracy. Most of the anecdotes in the book, as well as being sort of misrepresented, are a very, very sort of low stakes, but there is one exception. There is an example of actual political violence in the book, and it is the murder of anti-racist protester Heather Heyer at a Unite the Right rally when a right-wing thug drove his car into the counter-protesters. Trump famously said of this incident that there were, quote, good people on both sides. Curiously, this incident doesn't prompt the authors of the book to re-examine their thesis that the threat to democracy at that time was coming from left-wing students. Um, and at this point, I think we have to assume that that obtuseness is deliberate. Um, I should also mention the way that um, these political moments functioned as sort of moral panics with these talking points being picked up and repeated by the media ad nauseum um, with an endless stream of insufferable op-eds that sort of recycled the same anecdotes again and again and again. Um, I don't have time to go into sort of these anecdotes and um, you know the actual content behind them but if anyone wants to jump in um, with that in the discussion please be my guest. Um, so this is from Michael Hobbs's research. He found that in 1990, there were 65 articles in the US media with the phrase political correctness. In 1991, there were 1,500. By 1994, there were 7,000. Um, and then of course, in the 2010s, we had our own slew of insufferable op-eds that I would just like to, again, distress people by bringing, them back, bringing it back into their memories. 
Okay, so you can see why this is something that um, the right in New Zealand might want to try to emulate. Um, New Zealand politicians did have a go at the PC thing, but without much success. So in 2005, um, then party leader Don Brash, uh, National Party I believe at the time, tried to appoint a political correctness eradicator. Um, but by that point, PC politics was sort of past its peak and no one really cared. Um, and there were some ripples of the 2010s revival here too as well. So in 2017, a letter penned by concerned academics parroted the idea that free speech was under attack in the US and expressed fears that the same could happen in New Zealand, citing um, the protest at University of Auckland against the European Students Association, um, which was very clearly a white supremacist front group. Um, as far as I can see, COVID perhaps marks to marked a turning point here where um, politicians began to think that they could tap into um, these politics again. And that's a strategy that ACT and New Zealand First in particular have continued to pursue, although it seems as if National has sort of backed off that to some extent. Um, so let's, I want to, okay, so I want to, let's turn away from the US and think about um, some of the tactics that are being used on the right here around these free speech panics. Um, so first of all, um, what is a think tank? So a think tank is an institute that performs um, sort of uh, political policy research. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds sort of somewhat neutral, but they're generally very sort of politically oriented. So they exist to strategize around particular political projects and to provide research and material to further that agenda. Um, and often sort of putting a um, empirical gloss on what is actually very sort of political projects. Um, left wing think tanks do exist, but, you know, having a higher proportion of um, wealthy people with money to pour into these kinds of projects, they tend to be um, more of a right wing project and play a bigger role in right wing politics. Um, there are uh, right wing think tanks here in New Zealand, such as the New Zealand Institute, which has a sort of like free market um, approach. The Atlas Network is a global network of right wing think tanks. Um, so they receive funding from the mining industry, the oil industry, the tobacco industry. Um, they've been in the news a bit recently because they have been involved in campaigns against indigenous rights, both in Canada and in Australia. Um, they played a significant role behind the scenes in the recent voice referendum in Australia. Um, and uh, David Seymour's links to the Atlas Network have been the subject of scrutiny as well due to this. Um, so he is listed by the Atlas Network as among their graduates for the 2008 um, Atlas MBA for think tanks. Um, and a lot of the other sort of groups that I'll mention here as well have connections to this. Um, this sounds like a little bit tinfoil hat, but it's really like not that strange um, that right wing groups would want to strategize and share resources and sort of um, talk about politics um, globally. That's really not that surprising at all. It is interesting that David Seymour has sort of panicked um, and started denying his links to the Atlas Network. Um, so why is that? I think it's because um, the appearance of organicness um, is quite important to the political project that he's involved with at the moment. Which brings us to the second strategy I wanted to touch on. Um, what is astroturfing? So astroturfing is the creation of artificial grassroot, uh, grassroots groups in the service of a political agenda. So this is something that ACT has been criticized for, including by a former staffer called Grant McLaughlin. McLaughlin told RNZ that ACT was um, struggling to get attention on big issues like economic policy. So quote, they started to look for other issues or create new issues where they weren't going head to head with the National Party. They would create these astroturfs where they would break new ground and then they would appeal to the ground that was broken. So astroturfs differ from um, ordinary lobby groups or other organizations with political links um, because of the lack of transparency for the fact that they purport to be something that they are not. So they will masquerade as groups of concerned citizens and sort of hide their links to corporations or political parties um, and so on. 
Reports of astroturfing by ACT is often linked to the group called the Taxpayers' Union. Um, so for example, McLaughlin claimed that the Taxpayers' Union did a lot of groundwork for ACT in the 2020 election with their campaign for affordable housing to fight the, Greens, the Green Party's proposal for an asset tax. So McLaughlin says, uh, quote, so when they were saying this is a problem, it was actually a contrived problem that the ACT Party told them to create. Um, so who is the Taxpayers' Union and what about the Free Speech Union? So the Taxpayers' Union describes itself as an independent activist group running a grassroots campaign for lower taxes and against government waste. They were founded in 2013 by David Farrar and Jordan Williams. Farrar said at the time um, that it's fair to say we want to change where the so-called centre is. In theory, their focus is mainly around government spending, but in practice, they actually act to shift politics in a variety of other ways as well. Um, the connections between the Taxpayers' Union and the ACT Party often come under scrutiny, with many of its founders and members having um, links to the ACT Party. Um, and these links came under particular scrutiny when funding for the Taxpayers' Union doubled in the year um, from 2018 to 2019 from, uh, let's see, um, 406, uh, just over 400,000 to just over 800,000. Um, a variety of other groups in New Zealand have been sort of seeded by the Taxpayers' Union, such as Democracy Action um, and the Ratepayers Alliance, which we've mentioned. Um, they contributed behind the scenes organizing to the groundswell protests. There was a bit of controversy when that came to light and to the Stop Three Waters campaign. Um, the Free Speech Union is very much among the groups that have been seeded by the Taxpayers Union. Um, so they've reformed in response to the cancellation of Lauren Southern and Stephen Moller News speaking event, um, which, ooh, ringing bells. That was in that policy debate we just heard. Um, so uh, this cancellation sparked outrage apparently at the Taxpayers Union and a group of Taxpayers Union um, staffers, organizers, reconvened at their office the next day for a quote whiteboarding session. Um, within a couple of days they'd opened a bank account and created a website for the Free Speech Coalition, spearheaded by um, Taxpayers Union founder Jordan Williams. Their first action was to mount an unsuccessful legal challenge to the venue cancellation, and when they failed, they turned their attention elsewhere, rebranding as the Free Speech Union. Um, the Free Speech Union has, again, made some attempt to put a bipartisan veneer on their actions, but the overall project is transparently a right-wing one. Um, and there, so for example, they did one time speak up against the cancellation of a Rainbow Storytime event, but then they subsequently hosted a nationwide speaking tour of Gray and Lynham, who had openly called for drag story times to be banned. Among their victories have been defending an aged care worker who newly lost her job about, uh, after tweeting about Trump, and twice winning legal challenges for the group Speak Up for Women. They also campaigned against the introduction of hate speech laws. They've now turned their attention to university campuses, um, and you can clearly see the echoes of each other's rhetoric um, in the bill that um, ACT is putting forward and in the debate around the previous bill. Um, one of the early acts of network building was to reach out to the academics who signed the 2017 free speech letter that I mentioned earlier. More recently, they've launched a professional membership category for academics. Um, they also launched a poll of academics that found that only 56% of respondents felt free to challenge received wisdom and state unpopular opinions. Um, but when looked at more closely, the poll had a 2.8% response rate, or just uh, 552 responses to 16,000 emails. An amendment had to be added by the polling company saying that the results should quote, not necessarily be taken as representing the views of all academics in New Zealand universities. Um, recently, as Brad mentioned, a free speech panel was held here at Vic. Um, staff and students quite rightly raised objections to free speech union being part of that panel. Um, <clears throat> the panel was postponed and then rejigged with, can I get some water? And then rejigged with a more diverse panel, um, but still with the free speech union as part of that. 
I need my um, voice because I'm now going to spend more time than I need to roasting a random guy who uh, the Free Speech Union brought and taught around universities. Um, so in May this year, the Free Speech Union brought a guy called Jonathan Rauch, Jonathan Roach, something, around New Zealand universities. So they billed him as a lawyer and academic, um, but as he readily admits, he's actually neither. Um, he's just a guy who's written a book and some columns on free speech. Thank you. Um, and I really don't know that much about him, but he seems, from the interview that I read, he seems like a real weasel. So this is what he said when an interviewer asked him about the apparent po uh, parallels he saw between New Zealand and US politics. He says, the sense of outrage, the sense of passion, the complaints that you just can't have an honest conversation, that we've been shut down, all of that is right out of the US culture wars. From an outsider's perspective, I don't understand the issue. But people feel their core values and the future of liberal democracy is at stake. So it's very striking. People feel, some people feel that the future, not, you know, some people are calling it liberal fascism. Um, he's not saying the future, it, it is at stake, but he's not saying it's not either. Um, yeah, and it's pretty frustrating the way that he sort of purports to be, to sort of lament the political polarization that's happening, all while, you know, very clearly being used as a tool of it. So at one point in the interview, he says, there's no way you can go to escape the culture wars. You can't go to an island in the South Pacific and get away from it. It's like, yeah, you are bringing it with you. Um, to give a little bit more sense of like, okay, what, what actually are this guy's politics? Um, in the interview, he also um, raises concerns about the transgender issue and that um, it's not easy to sort of talk about this issue. Here's his quote. Um, it's still pretty hard to have a nuanced conversation in elite circles, but the peak of the chilling effect is behind us. I'm gay. The biggest cause of my career has been marriage equality and LGBT equality, but I am very concerned about the illiberal tactics used by some self-proclaimed trans activists. Some are calling it liberal fascism. Um, all right, so it's very obvious what the point of this tour was from the perspective of the Free Speech Union, and that's why I'm sort of spending a bit of time on it, and also just because I don't like this guy. Um, so in Canterbury, he apparently spoke to a meeting of academics and the Free Speech Union chief executive then um, sent around a, a newsletter to all of their followers describing the meeting as downright hostile and the most confrontational of the tour. Um, and one academic um, who isn't named in the interview was described as aggressive. Um, the New Zealand academics who attended this meeting seemed fairly surprised uh, by this characterization and also pointed out the hypocrisy of hosting a panel on free speech and then getting upset when those ideas are challenged. So Garrett Cooper, Associate Professor of Māori Indigenous Studies, said that calling the meeting downright hostile might be a good way of maintaining membership interest in the free speech union, but it, quote, has little relationship to reality. Um, in terms of academics' response to the presentation itself, um, their consensus seems to have been that it was biased and unscientific. Um, they said it presented an ideological view that the political left is suppressing right-wing views on campus based largely on US examples. Um, and they complained about the fact that even when Rauch referred to the limits of his knowledge, he then continued with the presentation as if it did not matter. Um, the academic who was called aggressive when she was approached for comment described the, uh, described the presentation as bizarre. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, all of this fuss around um, free speech on college campuses generated by the Free Speech Union um, has helped to sort of like swamp out more grounded recent analyses of issues of free speech on campus. Um, with one recent study, a 2022 report showing that academics are self-censoring, being bullied into silence, and working in a climate of fear because of their vulnerable employment status. Did I have a slide for that one? No, I have a slide for Palestine. Um, okay, so um, how long have I been talking? Have you kept track? That doesn't matter. Um, so I'll finish by talking about Palestine. Um, 
So we've talked a little bit about how this policy is not empowering to universities. Um, it's also not empowering to students and staff within universities. So if universities are prompted to write or to rewrite, you know, many of them already have these, their free speech policies, we should be concerned about what these are going to look like. Um, so free speech policies in the US and the UK have done nothing to stop the repression of Palestinian, pro-Palestinian speech at universities. And in fact, these policies, by delineating protections for free speech, um, often reinforce certain limitations and they slot neatly into sort of pre-existing policies that equate advocacy for Palestine with anti-Semitism or with support for terrorism. Um, it's worth, you know, considering as well, where would student demands for things like um, boycott and sanctions and divestment fit into um, these policies and whether these policies would incentivize a crackdown on student protest um, as not being in the spirit of uh, respecting people's free speech. Um, obviously, there's the point that there's a pretty clear hypocrisy here around um, right-wing positions on free speech when you look at the repression of pro-Palestinian speech on campuses. And I think there's also another point here, which is that um, uh, it highlights again the fact that distinctions need to be made between protest and censorship and between the politics and actions of university management versus those of students. Um, so universities can be liberal, they can be one to support for things like tetidity and queer rights, but they are still conservative institutions and in that they exist to perpetuate the current system. They are not democratic and increasingly they run it as businesses. Um, so university leaderships are risk averse, they fear controversy, and their primary concern is not for the safety of their students, but the safety of their reputations. Um, so the health and safety policy, which saw Don Brash cancelled at Massey, and which has been, you know, which the right love to harp on, actually bears some criticism from the left as well. Um, for example, it's been used to exert pressure on, and in some cases to shut down trans positive events not because the uni is anti-trans, but because the possibility of anti-trans agitation makes it too risky for them. So student activists clearly are coming from a very different position. Um, and we're coming out of a period of very low struggle without a vibrant student protest movement where I think these divisions were less clear. I think as protests now pick up around Palestine, I think these things will become more apparent. Um, in the past, uh, this, um, this lack of strength in the student movement um, sometimes led to a tendency to look to the institution, to look to universities to protect us, which has created some very difficult terrain for us to operate on. Um, and again, my hope is that uh, this Palestine movement will help to make those divisions more clear. And also the issue of Palestine is shifting the debate around speech in other directions. So students are now putting speech demands on universities themselves to denounce the genocide, to disclose investments. Um, and this has prompted some very interesting responses from universities as they've scrambled to justify their silence. So Massey Provost Giselle Burns releasing an, a statement about the right to remain silent. <laughs> Um, students very quickly sort of called rubbish on this um, neutrality, pointing out that it's not particularly um, <clears throat> it's not particularly neutral to refer to this as a war um, rather than a genocide. And in the very same week as this, um, Massey admitted that they had been investing in Israeli government bonds. So the comment section of this statement is now full of students pointing out the hypocrisy of remaining neutral in speech um, while actually supporting um, Israel in practice. Um, and I think this is another promising development. We're seeing a shift away from speech and towards action. So the disclosed demand only exists um, for the follow-up demand, divest. Um, the debate, thank God, is shifting away from speech and towards power. Um, and this is the direction basically that I'm hoping that these politics will continue in and that this will help to, to lift us out of the swamp the right has put us in um, and to help us to actually mobilize in a positive um, and offensive way for um, liberation from oppression, for the rights of students, for the rights of workers um, and the oppressed. Uh, 
yeah, I think I'll leave it there.